so um, you know it's funny because this is Torah, Torah anytime, right? So in Torah anytime records when I speak, and it must be confusing to the audience because thousands of people watch Torah anytime because I speak in a different way depending on the audience. So I want to tell the Torah anytime audience who's going to be watching this that the group of students that I'm speaking to today are a group of students that are growing in their Judaism in a dynamic and energetic way. And therefore, I'm going to speak to you in a way that I don't often speak to other groups. And I'm going to tell you an idea, just one idea tonight, just one, that is so foundational that one can say that this idea comes from the very depths of Musar. Anyone know what Musar is? That's self-perfection. The very, the, when we scrutinize ourselves and we want to reach the next level, Shabbat, of course, Kashrut, of course, we're doing that already. No, we want to, we want to transcend. We want to get to the next level. So I'm speaking to you, giving you all the benefit of the doubt that you're already here and you want to get way up there and that's going to be my talk for tonight, okay? When Barack Obama was elected president, immediately he picked up his phone and he began to Twitter, Facebook, and after, I don't know, one day or less, the Secret Service came over to our esteemed president and they said, uh, no. Now, I'm sure they said, your honor, no, but no, nonetheless. And Barack Obama says back, why? I'm trying to reach out. This is social media. And they said, yes, we understand. It's a different day and age, but you're the president. So Barack Obama says back, yes, I'm the president, but I'm also a father. I'm also a friend. I'm this and I'm that. I'm many things. So somebody with a lot of seichel, a lot of brains, said to him, no. When you're the president, everything that you do is through the eyes of you being the president. Even the kind of father you are, you're a presidential father. You're a presidential friend. Being the president is all-encompassing. And everything that you are is within the context of being president. When I call this talk, The Pizza Pie and You, I was thinking of an image. And the image is a pizza pie. I had just gotten from my family three pizza pies. And of course the kids attacked it. One vegetable slice and the other two plain. And we put it out there and it was all pre-cut. So even the youngest goes and just takes a piece of pie. And I was thinking to myself, piece of pizza, I'm thinking to myself, you know what this is? This is the way some people look at life. Part of me is the Jew in me. I'm Jewish. Part of me is the Bukharian. Part of me is the American. Part of me is the college student. Part of me is the boyfriend or the girlfriend. Part, right? We got many different parts to us. With Judaism being one of those parts. And I am here to tell you today that if that's our mentality, we're never going to get to that level that I spoke about in the beginning. There's a beautiful and important adjustment that we need to make. There is an organization called AA that stands for Alcoholics Anonymous. Now there are other organizations that also are anonymous organizations. There are many. There's even a Texters Anonymous. We think texting is, what's the big deal? Why would you have to have a self-help group or a help group for texting? You know, the average, um, the average teenager, you know how many texts they send a month? 5,000. Close, about 4,000. Of course, uh, of course, I don't know, it could be 5,000 is also normal. Uh, there, there are even, if you go to YouTube, you will find people who glorify in the fact that they've sent well over 100,000 texts in one month. It's, it's, really, it's really insanity. 
It's really insanity. All you got to do is break that up by 30 days, and you'll see that half the time they're texting. So there's a self-help group for that. Overeaters Anonymous, eating a lot, it's not good. Eventually, you can get very unhealthy, and you can get sick and die early. You got to get it under control. People go to Overeaters Anonymous, and Alcoholics Anonymous is the same way. So I, I was a rabbi in a synagogue, in a shul, and there was a fellow who was part of one of these anonymous organizations. And we were once having a talk, and he, he was like, he really believed in it, and he felt it was really helping him. Actually, I could tell you it was Overeaters Anonymous. And, and that, that was, he was part of that. And he told me something that I've applied to the rest of my life. In many, many circumstances, I just used it two days ago with one of my own children. He told me that the way that they look at life is like a cliff. Not one cliff, two cliffs. There's one cliff, there's a huge ravine that if you fall in there, you're going to die because it's like so deep. And then, the, then there's the cliff on the other side. And he says that the point of growing is to get to the other side of the cliff. From one, you have to traverse that ravine. You've got to jump over that gap and get to the other side. He said, what does that gap look like? What, what, is, what do both of those sides look like? And he said the following. He said, if I am an overeater, I'm eating a lot, and I try to control myself, but in my mind, every time I see a big juicy steak, every time <clears throat> I see <clears throat> an ice cream sundae, I have to do battle, then I'm still on the first side of the cliff. I have to get to the point that it's no longer on my radar. I don't have to do battle with it every, every moment. Now, the truth is, what these anonymous organizations will tell you is that even when I've gotten to the other side of the cliff, I'm always in danger of going back to the first side. So you can never assume, they say, once an addict, always an addict. That's fine. The question is, on which side of the cliff are you? So let me, let me um, show you how that applies to Judaism. How many people here, no, you know what, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. There is a mitzvah to put on tefillin in the morning. There is a mitzvah put on tefillin in the morning. It's a mitzvah from the Torah. I'm sure you all own tefillin. If you don't own tefillin, come to me. We'll get you a pair of tefillin. No biggie. Right? Tefillin is a huge mitzvah. When I wake up in the morning, do I have to do battle? Should I put on tefillin today or not? Well, let's see what time it is. I'm going to be late and I'm not going to have time to do breakfast. Maybe today I won't put on tefillin. If that's my mindset, I'm on the wrong side of the cliff. The very, even if I put on tefillin that day, but the fact that it's not, it's not part of me to the point that I'm not battling it means I'm on one side of the cliff. I've got to get to the other side where it becomes a natural. I will tell you, I need a diet right now. I do. I happen to. I feel I put on the pounds. But there was a time in my life that I was very careful about what I ate. I was living in Los Angeles. You really have to be a little bit careful because there's no winter. So you can't hide behind a coat. It's always summer in Los Angeles. So that's, why, that's really why people look better in these sunny climates because you can't hide, right? Like it's not like Queens and you're like, hey, what's up? Eat the hot dog, right? There, everyone's skinny because it's always summer. So, so I was living in L.A. and... I was on a diet. The diet lasted for about a year and a half, two years. It was amazing. I, whenever I, I'm sure you, some of you guys are like this. Whenever I'm on Facebook or whenever I have to put up a profile picture, it's from that time. You know, that's my profile picture from my diet, well, my two-year diet period. People say, you know, you don't look like that in real life. <laughs> I once did. I promise you that was me. I remember at that time passing by a kosher Nathan's. Now, they have kosher. They have one over here? No. So, Cornell, they have, 
They had a kosher Nathan's in L.A. And it was late at night, and I saw, I don't know, about half the store was full, and people were wolfing down huge hot dogs and hamburgers with the fat and the mustard dripping above the corners of their mouth and getting on their shirt and the mustard. And, the, and at that point, I was really on the other side of the cliff. And I sort of looked at them like, what are you guys thinking? I mean, it's 11 o'clock at night. You're probably going to go to sleep within an hour. How, how is that going to stay? Right? And I was on that other side of the cliff. And then I slipped. And now I'm back on the first side of the cliff. And 11 o'clock at night, I have no problem eating a hot dog. You know? I mean, I think about it twice. I'm getting older. But I was, on the, I was on the good side of the cliff. And when you get to that side of the cliff, life is totally different. Our job within Judaism is to get to the other side of the cliff, to get to the point where Judaism is the de facto. Do you know, what, what is it called um, when you have a, an electronic equipment and you made all sorts of adjustments and then you could put it to the factory setting? What is that called? Jailbreak. No, not jailbreak. You know, it's like the factory... Um, yeah, it's like factory restore. Factory restore, where it's factory restore, right? Your factory restore, your normal setting should be that Judaism is what it's all about. Not that it's just a slice of your larger pie. I had a good friend. His name was Ira Newborn. Ira Newborn lived in Los Angeles. And he was a music producer for movies. That means, you know, when you watch a movie, you may not even notice this, but there's music usually throughout the entire movie. Those are called musical scores. And there are some musical scores that you probably all know. da 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 Da, 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 da. What is that from? Star Wars. Star Wars, right? <laughs> da, 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 da. Right? So musical scores. Now, this fellow was not that prolific. <laughs> this fellow was not that famous, that prolific. But he made um, sort of comedy musical scores. Say so he did the Ace Ventura Pet, Pet Detective. You ever see those? He did those scores. He actually did the musical score for a, an old movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Twist and shout. Remember that? Twist and shout. Come on, come on, come on. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Right? Yeah. That was Ira Newborn. That's my buddy. Now, Ira Newborn was um, a lovely guy, very, very musically talented, a genius. And he began really thinking about life one day. And during his many thoughts, he said to himself, who am I? I guess this is the artist way of trying to figure out life. Who am I? And he made a list. He said, look, I'm a father. Well, I'm also a husband. I'm a musical producer. I am an American. I am a Jew. He made a list of all the things that he is, and you could all make the same kind of a list. This is who you are, right? And then he asked himself the devastatingly difficult and important question. What am I at the top of my list? Am I an American first? Am I a father first? Am I a music producer first? Am I a Jewish person first? Now, why is it important to make a list? It's pretty simple. Because what you are at the end of the day, whatever is at the top of that list, has to trump everything else. What you are at the top of the list trumps the next thing and the next thing. So, for example, let's say you've got a question. Am I an American first or am I a Jew first? Well, what would happen... Let's ask a very simple question. What would happen if there's a president that wants to be elected that has some really good policies for America but he doesn't like Israel and it's not good for the Jews? If you're an American first, you elect him. If you're a Jew, if you're a Jew first, you don't. 
Is that true? Depends if you support Israel. Let us assume, let us assume that whether or not you support Israel's policies, you support Jews. And if one does not support the Jewish people or even Israel, then maybe defense funding is cut. Uh, maybe Israel is in greater danger. Maybe Iran is given a free pass, which puts nuclear warheads aimed straight at Israel. Right? So you don't have to like Israel's policies to care about the Jewish people and their security. So that's a question. Who are you? Who are we? And Ira Newborn asked this question of himself. And he said, I didn't go into work for a week. For a week, I paced back and forth like a lion, asking myself, what am I? And he said, I shuffled and reshuffled and reshuffled that list, trying to figure out, who am I? Father, husband, Jew, American music producer. No, music producer, father, husband, Jew. He said, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, he realized that being a Jew must be at the top of the list. Because if you put it anywhere lower than the top, it becomes compromised. And when you compromise that, when, you're, when, when being a Jew is just one slice of your big pizza pie, then eventually your Judaism becomes nothing more than traditions that you'll keep when it's convenient, and when it's not convenient, you'll drop it. That's the bottom line. I want to give you, uh, I'll tell you a story about my father. My father is an emergency room doctor. When he was in high school, he began to become religious, more religious. He was not that religious. He began becoming more religious in high school. And by the time he reached medical school or near medical school, like he had finished college, he had joined a hill there, he joined a Chabad, whatever was around at that time. And he, he, he tried to study with the local rabbi. And then it came time to go for his interviews for medical school. And in those interviews, this was in the early 1960s. In your interviews, if you went with a yarmulke, you know what would happen? Anti-Semitism in the ni early 1960s and in the 1950s. My friends, you know, we don't know what anti-Semitism is in America. We, we hear once in a while, there's a, uh, a, a graffiti, a swastika. There used to be very overt anti-Semitism in the early part of the century and the mid part of the century. And my father was aware that when he went for his interviews, if he would walk in with a yarmulke, then there will be plenty of colleges that immediately, they'll look at him, they'll give him the interview, but they already made up their minds. He is not getting this job. He is not, he is not joining their medical school. And he said, I had a question. Do I wear the yarmulke? Or do I try to get into the best school that I can? That same shuffling. What am I? Am I going to be a doctor or am I a Jew? What comes first? Am I, yes? Get what you want to get and then go do your thing. You know what? Sometimes we can outsmart ourselves. Sometimes we have to have principles that define who we are. I'll tell you what happened. He decided to wear a yarmulke on principle that he's a Jew before a doctor. And he tells me that he knows for certain there were certain medical, medical schools where he went in for the interview. They looked at him and he could see in their eyes that... Totally, they ruled him out. They don't want a religious Jew. But you know what happened? He got into a school. Good school. Got in. And he did not take off the yarmulke. And then in class, he did not take the yarmulke off either. And the very first week, the professor says, there is going to be a quiz on Saturday. <laughs> My father whose English name is Neil, comes up to the professor and begins to try to tell the professor, can't take the quiz. And the professor says to him, oh, don't worry, Neil, you don't have to take it. I see, don't worry, you'll do it on Sunday. Wow. 
There was another Jew who grew up Orthodox, who was the son of a rabbi, but he didn't want to make waves, so he actually took off his yarmulke. But when he heard that the quiz was for Shabbat, like he never desecrated the Shabbat, forget it. So he goes running up to the professor right after my father, and he says, oh, professor, by the way, I am also, I can't take it on Shabbat. So the professor says, ah, 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 ah. No, 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 that's not the way it works. <laughs> Neil is a man of principle. He comes in with his yarmulke. It means something to him, so he doesn't have to take it. You, who do not have principles, you will take it or you will fail. And I found out later, I spoke to someone who was part of that class, that this professor gave this particular student a miserable time throughout his period, and he kept on having this professor again and again because he taught a number of subjects within the medical school. When you're a person of principle, that changes everything. There was a man whose name was Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Herman. And he lived in New York. He was a man of great principle. And he was a rabbi, lived in the Lower East Side, and he was also a furrier. He had a, a store where they sold furs, fur coats, fur stoles. And one day, it was Shabbat, and on Shabbat, of course, this rabbi has a lot of guests, and it's wonderful, it's beautiful. And in the middle of the Shabbat meal on Friday night, a knock on the door, someone goes, opens up the door, and there are two police at the door. And they say to him, um, is, um, is, Mr. Herman the, is Mr. Herman here? Is this where he lives? So they said, yeah, here he is. They call him Mr. Herman. So he comes to the door. He says, yes, officers, what can I do for you? So they say, we regret to tell you that your store is on fire and your stock is in the middle of burning up. Now, do you know what, you know what furs cost? You don't want to lose your furs to a fire. That's not like a fire in a jewelry store, right? That, that, the jewelry could last. Fur in a fire? So Rabbi Herman turns to the policeman and he says, thank you so much, we appreciate it, have a great evening. And they said, excuse me, don't you want to go down and see the damage? He says, no, I appreciate it, but today is Shabbat. Today is Shabbat, I'm not, really? I mean, your, your livelihood? Today is Shabbat, I'm a Jew before I'm a furrier. And all Shabbat, his daughter, who wrote the story, story, his daughter's name was Ruchama Shane. And Ruchama writes, I looked at my father to see where is the angst, where is the desperation, you know, where, where is it? Why, why, isn't, why doesn't this bother him? And it doesn't look like it bothers him. So, finally, Shabbat was over. It was, I'm going to turn this off. It was time for Havdalah. And could you imagine, it's supposed to be turned off. There we go, silent mode. It was time for Havdalah, and the father took his good, sweet time making Havdalah. And then after Havdalah, he, he, he took his time, and he gave each of the kids a blessing. And after everything was through, he comes to his daughter, he says, Come, Ruchama, let's go see the store. 24 hours later, and they go down, few miles away to where the, uh, uh, where the district was, where his store was located, comes down only to find that it was the first store across the street that had burnt up. There were two first stores and the police were given bad information and his store was intact. True story, Jew before Furrier. Such an amazing idea. Who are we? What makes us us? There was a, a rabbi who called me up and he said, there's somebody who should really go study in Israel. Because they've only, they've only they, you know, they don't know that much about their Judaism. And I feel they should go. They were about to go and then they changed their mind. So I said to the rabbi, tell them the following. Now, you guys know what a midlife crisis is? No, because you're not in midlife. Midlife crisis means 
that when, we're, when we become 40 or 45 years old, we begin to think about our lives. What did I do with my life? Did I do what I was supposed to do? Did I live life the right way? And there are a lot of people who smack into a midlife crisis like, Oh no, I'm getting old. I'm on the other side of the hill. And I didn't do what I needed to do. I didn't do what I wanted to do. And typically speaking, a guy in the midlife crisis, what does he do? He runs, in, he runs to the bank, takes out a big wad of money, buys a yellow Ferrari with the top that goes down, buys an inappropriate Hawaiian shirt, and goes uh, driving down to his quiet little neighborhood with the top down, waving to the neighbors. Hey! Hey! And everyone says, ooh, nice car, Bob. Hey! And they turn to each other, Bob's having a midlife crisis. Hey, Bob, nice car. Midlife crisis. I bet that was his kid's college money. Midlife, we love it, we love it. Keep it up. Midlife crisis, it's bad. And people make jokes about it, but the truth is, it's going to happen to all of you. Well, God forbid is right, but I'm going to teach you a trick how to get out of a midlife crisis. And by the way, midlife crisis can be very, very traumatic. It could really, there are, there are people who change their entire lives. People get divorced because of a midlife crisis. Oh no, I'm stuck with the same person and I'll be with them the rest of my life. It's terrible. So I'm going to give you the three keys to avoid a midlife crisis, okay? We call them the three clarities. Three clarities. You have to have clarity in three things. Number one, you have to have clarity in your chosen occupation. Chosen occupation means, do you enjoy doing what you're doing for a living? If you reach the age of 45, and suddenly you realize, you know, I hate doing what I'm doing. I spent the past 25 years sitting in a cubicle from 9 to 5, working for the man, just to bring home a paycheck at the end of the month, just so I can go to the bank and cash it, so I'll have money for food and clothing, so I can eat, so I can sustain myself, so I can go to work in a cubicle for the man. And it's a crazy rat race. It's a vicious cycle. If that happens, then by the time you're 45, you're going to bump into a severe midlife crisis. So number one, you have to have clarity in your chosen occupation. Why did I choose what I chose? Am I enjoying it? And if you don't enjoy it, it's going to be bad. I even know of a student whose father was a high-priced lawyer. And at his midlife crisis, he said, you know, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I always wanted to be a teacher. So he quit his law firm and became a public school teacher, which pays approximately one-tenth of what he was making. But at least he's happy. Could you blame him? At least he's doing what he wants to do. That is the concept. So number one, clarity and chosen occupation. Does that make sense to you? You got to have it. Make up your mind that you're going to enjoy doing what, whatever it is you decide to. Number two, you have to have clarity in your family relations. When you get older, all of a sudden you realize, I need people around me. I need a support system. And if, when you get older, you're not speaking to your kids, you and your spouse are on the, on the, on the, uh, on the brink of divorce, or are fighting all the time, if you're family relations are not strong, then you reach midlife and you say, you know what, I may die alone. I may die without friends. I may die without a support system. And therefore, number two, if you want to avoid a midlife crisis, may keep your family close. You're in a fight? Make up. Make up. What's so important? Don't be petty. Make up. So that's number two. Family, chosen occupation. What's number three? Number three is spirituality. You have to have clarity in spirituality. Now, I'll tell you why this is so critical. When we get to be a little bit older, we suddenly realize that we're not going to be around forever. What are the physical signs that we're not going to be around forever? Well, when we hit 40, we have our first minor surgery. 
when we hit 50, we have our first major surgery. That's, that's the timeline. That's how it goes. I actually had my first minor one exactly when I was 40. Looking forward to that 50 one, right? 40, that's, why? What happened? Uh, that's between me and my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> never, never mind. Yes, but I'll let you know about the 50 one. No, I'm not. I'm not. Don't worry. <laughs> so, um, you know, you get a little bit older and all of a sudden the hair on the front of your head begins to, uh, the, right, <laughs> recede. It retreats. <laughs> when you get to be a little bit older, all of a sudden you have more crowns than teeth and then you begin to lose those teeth. The wrinkles on your face scream. You're getting older. Even the hair begins to turn white like it all gave up. You know? So when you get, that's okay. So when you get a little bit older, you suddenly realize you will not be around forever. One day we will be in cozy little confines, six feet underneath Mother Earth. And we have to ask ourselves the following question. Have I done it right? Have I lived life the right way? Have I made the world a better place? Did I uh, act honestly and fairly in my business? All of those questions we ask ourselves when we hit that midlife point. And if we don't have clarity in our spirituality, if we don't know why we're living, is there a next world? That's another spiritual question. Do we believe in a heaven and a hell? Do we believe in an afterlife? Do we believe in reward and punishment? All those questions plague somebody who hits the midlife point. It may not plague you. You're still thinking about finding that girl or that guy and getting a career. But when you get to that point, those spiritual questions come back to haunt you. And you're going to have to have good answers to those questions. So number three, the way to avoid a midlife crisis is to have spiritual clarity. To know what you're doing, why you're doing it, how it made the world a better place. So those are the three clarities. Let's review. Clarity in, clarity in your shows and occupation. Clarity in family relations. And clarity in spirituality. Now, I think to myself, how much time did we give to each of these clarities? Which is the one that's going to do us in? Well... Chosen occupation, I think we work all of our lives, right? We go to high school, we go to college, we go to internships, we try, you know, we're all working on getting that perfect job, that occupation that satisfies us. Number two, family relations with all of our lives. Also, we're working. Sometimes we fall, sometimes we don't do it right, but at least it's a work in progress. What is the clarity that we don't work on as much and that needs the effort, it's our spirituality. So I told this rabbi, tell these people that if they haven't given the effort to get spiritual clarity, that's going to do them in. And, I'll, and, and here's, here's the main point. I believe that spiritual clarity is the most important. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a rabbi. I believe it is because those are the glasses that we use to, to look at, to find clarity in the other two things. Think about it. Chosen occupation. What we choose depends on our spiritual clarity, on the glass that we view life through. My occupation. What is it? Is it good? Is it honest? Is it decent? Is it making the world a better place? Maybe we don't want to just you know, make another shortcut to Microsoft Windows. Right? Maybe we want to do something to make the world better. Don't we all want to make an impact? So our spiritual clarity is critical to finding a chosen occupation. Family relations, exactly the same. How we ch who we marry, how we raise our kids, what neighborhood, all that family clarity, again, depends on spiritual clarity. So therefore, spiritual clarity is really the glasses that we use to find the other two clarities. And yet, it's what we give the least amount of time towards. And this is what I'm saying when I speak about the pizza pie. The spiritual clarity, that, that clarity, that has to be the glasses. That's the entire pie. That's, that, that's who we are. Jew first. And then, chosen occupation, family, 
business, leisure, pleasure, all of that comes. There was a, a story, someone just told me this very, very cute story. There was a, a, a man who was very poor, and he went to the Kotel to, because he had, a, he had a son who was going to be bar mitzvah, and he didn't have money. So he went to the Kotel, and he saw this guy there, and, you know, the guy sees him, and, and he's davening, and the guy says, are you okay? He says, yeah, I'm just davening because I don't have money to pay for my son's bar mitzvah. So, it turns out this guy was wealthy, and he says, how much do you need? And he gives him the amount, and the man writes out a check. He says, here you go, make your son's bar mitzvah. So, someone... And he says, thank you very much, and he leaves. So someone who was watching all this says, is this the only son you have? He said, no, I have another son afterwards. Well, why didn't you get that person's information? I mean, you should be able to go back to that source for a second time. So why don't you get his information? He said, oh. he said I don't understand what you're asking. I'm going to go back to the source a second time. I'm going to go back to the wall. The source is the wall. It's not the person. Judaism says, make Hashem your source. And everything else, if it's not from this person, it's from that person. If it's not from there, it's business. You, Hashem will find a way. But your Judaism, and what it means to you, that has to be the deal breaker. I wrote myself a few notes over here. I want to make sure I don't forget. And, oh, here's a really critical point. Do you know that there's an upside to everything that I said tonight? There's an upside. The upside goes like this. I own a nice car. Now, I don't own a nice car because I was looking to own a nice car. It came around. It just happened like that. I have art. I traded a painting for a car. Great. You never know how these things are going to come about. Now, I could feel really good driving around in my nice car. And what I'll have at the end of the day is a nice car until I bang it up, which I'm sure will happen, or someone sc scrapes it, which has already happened, and, uh, and then that's it for the nice car. Or I can take that car and say, since having a nice car is not just one more slice in I'm Jewish, I'm a rabbi, I'm a father, I'm a guy who drives a nice car, no. Driving a nice car is connected to my Judaism. Having a nice house is connected to my Judaism. My health is connected to my Judaism. Being a father is connected to my Judaism. How does that work? It's very simple. There was a great rabbi who wrote a book called the Yesod V'Shar Shavoda, which means the foundation and the root of service of the Almighty. And he said the following. We have the potential to gain mitzvot, to gain great deeds with great rewards, doing things that we're doing anyways. How do we do this? All you need to do is think for a moment before you do a certain deed. For example, I go to sleep. I can go to sleep because I'm tired, and then I spent the next eight hours simply sleeping until I got up. But if I go to sleep, and right before I go to sleep, I say whether in my mind or in my, with my mouth, I'm going to sleep because tomorrow I want to daven shacharit. And I want to daven with great concentration. And then I want to be a, a happy person so I can treat my co-workers and my friends and my spouse pleasantly. I won't be able to do that if I'm grouchy and tired. And all the good things that come from being well-rested, and therefore that's why I'm going to sleep then the entire eight hours that you were sleeping, every second you got a mitzvah. That crazy? That means that you could go to sleep and get nothing or go to sleep and let the meter run. I could eat because, wow, I like sushi, or wow, I like pizza, or I like steak, or you could take a moment and say, yeah, I do, you don't have to say I don't like sushi, yeah, I like it, but I'm also eating because I want to have energy to learn Torah, to do good deeds, to act honestly and fairly in my business, to be cheerful, and I can't do it if I'm not sustained, I can't do it if my stomach is growling, 
and therefore I'm going to eat for the right reason. And every bite and every swallow becomes a mitzvah. That's the upside to understanding what it means to make Judaism that, that side of the cliff, to make it our identity, Jew before everything else. What an upside. That means that everything that we do, even when we take a haircut, even when we shave, it could be a mitzvah. As long as we don't use a razor, got to use a shaver, you know that. But if you use a, a shaver, electric shaver, you get a mitzvah. And you get a double mitzvah because you can even say, I'm using a shaver because the Almighty said, don't use a razor on your face. And therefore, by using a shaver, I'm doing it on purpose and not using a razor because that's what the Almighty wanted. Yeah? How were people shaving before the, the shaver came out? So they used scissors and it wasn't a very close cut. It wasn't very close. Or there's another way to do it which uh, is still used in many communities. A lot of African American communities use this. It's a kind of a powder. And you take the powder, you know what it is, right? And you put it on your face, you let it sit for a few minutes, you peel it off, it burns a little, your face red, but then you don't have to shave for two weeks. So uh, there's an upside to that also. I, I think that, yeah. I don't think that's for men, but uh, maybe you can use it, I don't know. But, but, but you're, you're able to shave and get a mitzvah. You buy nice clothing, I'm buying it because a, a Jew should walk around properly. We shouldn't walk around like, 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 like we're messy. They should, oh, dirty Jew. No, I'm clean, like I'm wearing a nice sweater. Good for you. That's what a Jew should do. So now every moment you wear a nice sweater, you get a mitzvah. And you have an extra nice clothing. Hey, I'm wearing, wearing it because I'm Jewish. I'm wearing it because Shabbat is coming. So I'm going to spend extra money. We can live amazing lives. Two people can do the exact same thing their entire lives. And yet the result, once they get to the next world, will be dramatically different. All because of two seconds worth of thought. And that only comes because we view Judaism as our entirety and everything is a slice within Judaism. This is the great danger of America. America dances and sings about tradition, culture. Culture is one of the words that I, I hate the most, and not because my father is a doctor and we used to get a lot of strep tests. So I, <laughs> the word culture to me, oh, got to get a culture, get it right? <laughs> no, I don't like culture because culture is a replacement word. I'm replacing something that is truly meaningful, something that should be my essence, and I'm relegating it to culture. Do you understand? It's very different. Even schools, there are, there are some modern schools out there, Jewish schools, even Orthodox schools. But you can see there's something missing. So, well, we learn many subjects in our school. We learn math, we learn history, we learn Gemara, we learn Diktuk, we learn social studies, and they like sort of clump it together like each thing is a separate piece of the pie, almost equating math and history and social studies to Chumash and Gemara. I remember when, years ago, I, I, was, I was reading a, a newspaper, it was in Los Angeles, and one of these, it was an Orthodox school, it was not, it was like, sorry, it was a co-ed school, but it was, it was Orthodox, and they, and they put an ad in the paper trying to get more kids to their high school. We have the best teachers and we have an amazing computer room and a rebuilt gym and, and so on a whim, I didn't really care. I mean, my kids weren't going to that school. But on a whim, I'm looking at this ad, and I call up, and I call, I call up, I get a machine, and I say, Hi, I'm a father of many children. I was looking at your ad for the school, and there was something that bothered me. Because as I'm looking at the ad, the one word that I found missing is the word Torah. And I thought this is an Orthodox school. So I'm just wondering about that. Well, thank you. Troublemaker. <laughs> That's what I did. I just left that message. Guess what? They put another ad the next week. And we learn lots of Torah. <laughs> it's crazy that I had to make that phone call. Like, wouldn't you imagine? But there's a reason it wasn't there. It's because, yes, it's important, but it's not that important. It's not that important. It's just another subject. Secondary. What? 
Secondary. It's secondary. It's secondary. It's one of the things that I do. I do Judaism. I do American. I do Yankees. I do this. I do that. Once Judaism becomes it, then everything else has a way of falling into place. It really does. I'll tell you why it does. In psychology, there is a concept. And the concept is, is known as the central factor or the determining factor. And what, it, and what the concept means is like this. We all have that one idea or that one passion where when it comes down to it, that's what motivates us. So for some people, it's making money. For some people, their centralizing factor is making money. At the end of the day, whatever I do, wherever I am, whatever conversation I have, it's really about making money. That is the, that's the core, that's the pinnacle, that's the root. That's the root. The root is making money. There are some people who the root is food. They live from breakfast to lunch to supper, every moment of every day, they think about, okay, now, uh, okay, lunch is over, but let's see, what am I going to eat for supper? And then every, all day long is a countdown to the next meal. Countdown, okay, T minus three hours to supper, T minus two hours to supper, there we go. There are some people who the centralizing factor is sports. They live from game to game. They live... 660 gets put on the moment they get into the car and they, they must get the updates on their, on their phone and they live from season to season. So I go from football to basketball to baseball, maybe even hockey. And when I'm very desperate, I'll engage in March Madness. And then if I'm ultimately desperate and I live in the South, I'll include NASCAR. And I've got something going on and I've got college football. And I'm telling you, this is how they, they, they call them sports widows. You know what a sports widow is? It's someone who's married to a sports fanatic. So they say, I'm a sports widow. So it used to be, it used to be sports widows would be, their husbands would be inaccessible during football season. Except after football season, right away that blends into basketball season. And the basketball season ends by baseball season. And you go on and on, and there's no break. And for some people, they, they live game to game. I'll be honest with you, I grew up with sports. There was a time in my life that it was so important. If my football team would lose, I, was, I grew up in Cleveland. If the Cleveland Browns would lose, forget it. My week was dead. I was, I was like, eh. like, until Wednesday. Then Wednesday already, I was, I was looking forward to the next week. But Sunday... Forget about it. My, if they lost to the Steelers, even worse. Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday would roll around, and maybe I'd be able to pick it up. What is that centralizing factor? What is it that at the end of the day determines what you do for a living, who you love and how you love them, how you make your money, what you eat, what you think about? The Almighty said, make it me. The Ahavta as Hashem Alokecha, Bechal Levavcha. All your heart. Not half of your heart. Love me with all your heart. Make me your priority. If you could do that, have a nice car, buy a gorgeous suit, eat a delicious meal. But each thing that you do, do it because you want to connect a little more to me. You want to have a beautiful suit for Shabbat. You want to have a nice car because you're driving from, a, from point A to point B and you want to arrive relaxed. You don't want it to, to worry, is it going to break down? Or when I used to buy uh, uh, my cars, so one of the things I used to do is I would lend it out to guys who, needed, who were going out on dates and they needed to find their bashert, and they didn't have a car, and I felt, wow, here's my car, yay, I get to use it for a mitzvah. So now my four wheels are bringing me to Olam Abba. Right? Bechal levavcha, with all your heart, make it about me, and then I'll be your glasses. You could find everything else within me. Hashem does not want us to negate the rest of the world. Hashem doesn't want us to throw out earthly desires and, 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 and wonderful pleasures. That, that's not our goal. The goal is just to focus 
what we're doing to make it a little more spiritual. If we could do that, we have a chance of making this world just a little bit better. Because the Almighty is our partner. Does this make sense to you? That's why I'm giving this talk to you guys. Because you've already incorporated Judaism as part of your life. You said, I want to be part. So now I'm telling you, don't make it part. Make it all of your life. And then if you do that, then everything else will fit in. If you don't, something else will become all of your life. Whether it's money, whether it's food, whether it's fame, publicity, something is going to replace it. It is impossible for a person to live without that centralizing factor, without that one idea, that one passion that motivates them. The Almighty says, make that me. I'll end with a story. There was a man who was married for a number of years. They had a child and was married for about 10 years. But over the last year or so, the marriage um, it began to grow cold. He wasn't feeling love. He wasn't feeling, he wasn't feeling connection. And meanwhile, or perhaps coincidentally, at the same time that he was growing distant from his wife, a new secretary appeared in the office. Her name was Jill. And he began to pal around with Jill, and eventually he fell in love with Jill. And the more he loved Jill, the less he loved his wife, whose name was Jane. And that's what happened. He, he just... It's just not, not a Jewish couple. It's a true story, but not, not a Jewish couple. And he was really falling out of love with her. They stopped being intimate together. I mean, eventually they, they weren't even touching each other. They were like living in the same house like roommates. They're trying to be polite. Eventually, this man tells Jill in his office, his secretary, you know what? I'm going to give my wife the news. We're gonna, we have to end this. this. This marriage is going nowhere. And then I will marry you, Jill. And Jill was thrilled. <laughs> he comes home and he says to his wife, he says, Jane, we have to talk. And she knew what that talk was about and she said, no, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it. He says, no, no, we really do have to talk. No, no, let's, let's just eat. No, we have to talk, Jane. We, we can't go on like this. We have to talk. Finally, he gets her to sit down at the table and he says to her, Jane, listen, it's over. It's over. We need to get divorced. I don't feel love for you anymore. And Jane begins to weep and cry. And she's crying at the table. Why? Let's work it out. We could try. We can make it happen. And the more he saw her sobbing and losing herself, the less connected he felt to her. He just felt bad for her, like she's being pathetic. So he's, she say, he says, you know what, this is going to end. They had an, an eight-year-old son. Didn't know what to do with him, but this is going to end. And she tried, she begged, begged. That night, he stayed up all night trying to think about what he could offer her. And the following morning, he hands her a piece of paper, and on it he says, Jane, because you were my loyal wife for all these 10 years, I am giving you the house, I'm giving you the car, and 30% of my business. She picks up the paper, and she rips it up in front of his face. She says, no, no, it, it's not going to go down like this. I'm going to get back to you. The following morning, Jane says to her husband, she says, listen, I understand you want to get a divorce and I'm going to agree. And I don't want the house, I don't want the car, I don't want 30% of your business, but I have two requests. You agree with these two requests and I'm out of your hair. Number one, I want you to wait 30 days. And don't say anything to our son. During these 30 days, don't tell him 
that you plan on divorcing me, don't say anything. And request number two is, during these 30 days, I would like you to pick me up every morning. When I, it's time for me to go to work, I want you to pick me up and carry me down the stairs and then drop me at the, uh, at, at the, at the door, at the entrance, from our bedroom to the entrance of our house. Do you remember how when we bought this house, and we were in love and you were excited. You lifted me up and you carried me across the threshold. Well, I remember that. I remember that love, that tenderness, and how romantic that was. I want that for the next 30 days. Pick me up from our bedroom when it's time for me to go to work and bring me to the front door. So he said, I'll, I'll get back to you. So he gets to the office and he calls Jill in and says, Jill, this is what she wants me to do. She doesn't want the house. She doesn't want the car. She doesn't want the business. What do you think? So Jill says, you know what she's trying to do? This is a mind game. She thinks she's going to psych you into, into keeping her. You know what I say, says Jill? I say, do it. Do it. I mean, you, you love me. You don't love her. Why, why give her the house? Why give her the car? You know, why give her the business? Do it. So he says to Jane that evening, okay, I'll do it. And after 30 days, we're going to get divorced. The following morning, it was time for him to carry Jane down the stairs. And he lifts her up, and it was very awkward because they hadn't even touched in a while, let alone, you know, let alone that, that, that closely, that intimately. And he picks her up, and it was sort of clumsy as he carries her down the stairs. And he places her at the front of the door and he thought that was strange, that was weird, but, but I did it, that's it. Didn't do anything for him, didn't move him, didn't shake him, but he did it. The next few days, it became a little bit like a routine. He picks her up, carries her down, this is what we do. As a matter of fact, there was one day that he almost forgot and a little eight-year-old says, Daddy, it's time to carry Mommy to work. And he looks in the, his little boy's eyes. Little, little does he understand, little does he realize. And he picks her up and brings her down. Day number eight. He's picking her up. And she looked pretty tired. Picks her up. And she rests her head on his shoulders as he's bringing her down the stairs. And for the first time, he noticed how light she had become. She had lost a lot of weight. And he says, you know, I haven't really been such a good husband. I really haven't. Look at her. I felt a little bit of remorse. And each day, as he lifted her up and brought her down the stairs, she'd rest her head on his shoulders. He would smell the shampoo in her hair. He would, he would just get a little bit nostalgic, a little bit wistful for that love that somehow had faded away. By day number 25, he was beginning to feel genuine love and he was trying his best to fight it. And each day he would come to work and Jill would be, okay, just a few more days, a few more days. But as she would say that, he would remember the haunting face of his wife looking up at him as she, he carried her down the stairs. Day number 30 had arrived and he picks her up and she was so light and she rests her head on his shoulders and he looks into her eyes and she looks into his and their eyes locked, their eyes met and little tears began to form in both of their eyes knowing that today was the last day. He put her down and he drove to work in utter turmoil. And by the time he had arrived to wo at work, he knew exactly what he had to do. He calls Jill into his office and says, Jill, I can't do it. I realize I still love my wife. I realize that I was not putting in the effort that I needed to put into that relationship. She was not my everything anymore. When she was not my everything when she became just a slice of my life, 
Well, there was room for a lot more. And eventually there was room for me to follow my own desires and my own whims. And, and eventually, you know, I, I, I just was led astray. I have to make my wife my everything. And only if she is my reason for living, only then can there be real love. And Jill begins to cry and scream and yell in a tantrum and throwing things down. And he says, Jill, leave the room. You got to leave. No, you promised. I've been waiting. Jill, leave the room. No, security. <laughs> After they escorted Jill out of the building, he calls up the florist and orders the biggest bouquet of flowers you could imagine. He had them delivered to his office. He didn't want them delivered to his house. He wanted to hand them to her. And that evening, actually it wasn't the evening, it was already the afternoon. He decided to come home a little bit early. He wanted to surprise her. So he drives home and he was going to give it to her as she walks in the house. And as he pulls into the driveway, he sees that her car is still there. She never left. Usually they each go to work. But her car is still there. It's very strange. So he comes in the house and he's holding the bouquet. And he says, hello, my dear, I'm home. Where are you? I have something for you. And I want to tell you something. I want to bear my heart to you. I want to confess to you. I want to connect with you. Where are you? And he looks around the entire first floor and she's not there. He runs upstairs to the bedroom and he opens the door and his wife is lying there on the bed and her eyes are shut and he goes over to her and says, Hello, are you sleeping? Wake up. Wake up. No, oh, wake up. Can you hear me? Wake up. Jane had passed away. Jane had cancer and she never told her husband. They had lost their connection in such a, in, in, in such a fatal way that she, she didn't feel like she would get any sympathy from him. And when the doctors told her it was incurable, she knew he wouldn't be there for him. And even if he would, it would just be out of pity. And that's not what she was looking for. So she never said anything. And that's why she got lighter and lighter every day. She was dying in his arms. And he never had the chance to tell her, I wish you were my everything. I wish I never lost sight of our marriage and our love. There are Jews who say that all the time. They're older. They're involved in their business. They've got season tickets to whatever sports team they follow. They go out to eat every Monday and Thursday. They've got their poker game. And yes, they go to davening shachers. And maybe once or twice mincha mayrev. But it's just, it's just one of the pieces of the pie of their life. And maybe not even the biggest piece. If that's what it is, we'll never reach the highest of heights. We'll never put on those amazing glasses that the Almighty has given us that will allow us to connect to Him and see everything in life through spiritual lenses. That's my blessing to you. Transition. Get to the other side of that cliff. Stand there. Say, no, this is my de facto. This is the factory setting. The factory setting is, I am Jewish. The factory setting is, Hashem is my Hashem. Bechalavav means with all my heart. And yes, I'll be normal. I'll remain normal. I'll do everything I need to do. But it's with Hashem as my partner in life that I'm going to do it. Thank you very much.